All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's 1 o'clock here, so we're going to get rolling. Um, thanks for joining us today. We're really excited to talk kind of all things ultrasound, which seems right up our alley, so it's perfect for us to uh, to kick off the summer with this topic. Um, so today, Doug Wagen is going to be talking about ultrasound for condition and remote monitoring. So, you know, kind of give you all the all the ways that you can utilize ultrasound for, for both those things. So um, hopefully this will be really informative for you all and we look forward to um, sharing this info. So before we get started, just a little bit of um, housekeeping for you. So first off, we are recording this. So if you've got to hop off early or if um, you, you know, you've got colleagues who you wish could have participated. We'll have it up on our website later today, so you can check back in on it, review parts that, that you want to see again, or like I said, if, if you've got colleagues you want to share this with, um, you'll have that ability. Uh, we definitely welcome questions, so the way we'll handle those is you can type those into the little questions box. I'll be keeping an eye on those as, as Doug goes throughout his presentation. Um, if it makes sense to, to kind of interrupt and, and get him to touch on something that someone got a question on before he hops off the topic, we'll do that, or obviously, you know, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, also, like to just point out, you know, if we run into any technical difficulties, um, just to bear with us, you know, we really love doing these live. Um, it just kind of feels like a cool way to, to kind of connect with you all um, when we're not able to actually be together at conferences or things like that. Um, but it does obviously open us up to internet issues, audio issues, those kinds of things. So just bear with us. We'll We'll hop on trying to fix whatever may come, and um, hopefully we won't have any issues, but I'd like to put that little disclaimer out there. So with that, I am going to switch the screen here over to Doug, and Doug, we'll let you take it away. Thanks, Maureen. I'm going to go ahead and do it from my slideshow from beginning. How's that look? Perfect. Well, great. Well, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, for spending some time with us today uh, about a subject that's certainly near and dear to our hearts, and obviously uh, by the number of people that have signed up, uh, near and dear to many of your hearts as well. Um, we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about the different ways we use ultrasound for condition monitoring. Uh, we're going to focus on rotating assets, so motors, gearboxes, bearings, fans, pumps. Um, obviously, there's other applications for ultrasound, but we would need several more hours to go through all of the applications. So today, the, the big focus is going to be on how we do condition monitoring on your rotating assets. And we've got a lot of different options for you. Some of these you're probably very familiar with, some you may not be as familiar with. So I'm going to try to give equal time to, to all the different ways that you can attack um, checking your bearings, checking your motors, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about our Ultra Probe handheld condition monitoring devices like the Ultra Probe 15000. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about our digital grease caddy, the Ultra Probe 401, and some of the things that you can do with that tool to enhance your, your condition based lubrication program or even start transitioning over from time based to condition based. And then we'll get in at the end to a little bit of our, our permanent. Uh, options. We'll talk about uh, both analog and digital ways to do real-time condition monitoring of your assets uh, and continuous uh, monitoring over time where we're able to do quite a few different things. We're able to still record dB levels and trend them. We're able to record sounds and we can do this all remotely without actually having a person standing at the asset. Um, so as we get started here, just a little bit about UE Systems. If you're not familiar with our company, uh, we've been around forever over 45 years history working with ultrasound and we've come up with a bunch of different products over time uh, we've come up with a ton of different handheld ultra probes and for those veterans out there uh, the, the changes have really been incredible over the last 10 years of what we're able to do um, more user-friendly obviously a, a lot of the newer um, 
ultra probes like the ultra probe 15,000 use touchscreen technology so it makes it real easy to navigate uh, through the different menus and and do the do the different tasks that you need to do um, the data transfer has become much easier uh, as the technologies improved using an SD card uh, for quick data transfer from our handheld tools into your laptops or desktops uh, and into our DMS software rather than using cables um, a lot of that is because of the increased processor capacity um, and the vastly improved battery power. I mean, the lithium batteries we're able to use now uh, give us a lot more processing ability on board these handheld units. And then we get into our permanent sensors that we'll talk about a little later. Uh, those systems are advancing uh, for a lot of different reasons. Some of it is the technology uh, and, and a lot of the R&D we've done and a lot of the newer remote sensing products we've come out with have been based on you folks. It's been based on our end user needs have changed over time. And we like to sort of keep up with uh, with what people need to be able to do their condition monitoring tasks more efficiently and more effectively out in the field. So as far as the sensor advancements, a lot of that is software driven. So the software is able to, to analyze and store tremendous amounts of data more than ever in the past. Uh, processors let us digitize the information a lot faster. Um, so even with our, our handheld units, we're able to do our spectrum analysis and time waveform analysis right on board the instrument, as opposed to in the past having to record that sound and do post-processing on a computer. Um, and then the other thing that helps with our remote sensing applications is that this digital information uh, and the, the sound files can be sent over networks that most plants already have in place. For example, uh, an ethernet. And we'll talk a little later about our forecast system, which is a 24 seven ethernet enabled system that lets you monitor an asset 24 seven and store the information on board and then when needed, send it through the ethernet over for a, for a permanent historical record. So a lot of changes and a lot of changes for, to the good. Um, end users needs evolving. That's a, that's a big one for us. We try to keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on out in industry. Uh, and, what, and what we found is a lot of safety requirements out there, a lot of additional shielding and guarding on motors. It limits the ability to go and, and do the condition monitoring that you need to do to go out and run your monthly routes. Um, so we've tried to come up with some solutions and we've come up with some real good ones uh, to help you uh, when you've got that, that situation there, when, it, when it's difficult to go do PDM on something you need to do PDM on because of shielding and guarding. Some of the other things that, that have come about, I mean, obviously less manpower, so we've gotta be more efficient in the way we do, go do our data collection. Uh, we still need consistent data. The systems need to be smarter. We need to be able to set up some parameters and set up alarm levels that aren't so dependent on special skills, um, much less dependent on a human having to do the data interpretation. Uh, there, there's many applications where we, we do rely on data interpretation, but as far as sort of a first line of defense, we're able to automate a lot of that, especially with our with our permanent systems. We're able to automate that that alarm um, when we hit an alarm, being able to notify someone that it's in alarm and be able to take the necessary steps before we have a catastrophic failure. So really, we view it as three ways to monitor the condition of your assets. One of them is pretty traditional. It's going out and doing handheld data collection with an ultra probe or with one of our, our grease caddy instruments. Going out, taking DB levels, taking wave files when appropriate and trending them over time. Another way to monitor is by continuously monitoring with some of our permanent sensors. Uh, Probably the best way to approach it or attack, you know, your, your rotating assets is by using a combination of both. There's still certainly um, a place for doing monthly route-based data collection, and there's certainly a place for some of this continuous monitoring. So we'll, we'll talk as we go through this, uh, and I'll sort of point out some opportunities where you really need to be doing both in your facility to do the best job at your condition monitoring. 
So some options for handheld data collection are UltraProbe series of instruments, the UltraProbe 15,000, which is a fully digital unit, touchscreen technology, uh, onboard sound recording, onboard spectrum analysis, uh, and, and time waveform analysis. So you sort of have everything you need in the palm of your hand when you go out and take monthly readings. The 10,000 does a lot of the same things, not a touchscreen. Um, but many of you probably are familiar with the 10,000, also a digital unit. It also lets us record sound files, DBs, and do the trending. Uh, and very similar to the 10 is the 401 Grease Caddy, which we're using now as an integral part of people's lubrication excellence programs as many plants have transitioned over from time-based lubrication to condition-based, the 401 has some unique features, which I'll talk about later, um, that let us do a better job at that. And then again, to address some of the uh, some of the access issues, some of the shielding, the guarding that make it difficult or unsafe to go in and take monthly readings, we've got some solutions. We have our RAS sensors and our magnetic, our RAS MT sensors uh, that let us either permanently attach to an asset and run the cables back to a safe, convenient location to take readings, or our RAS with the MT, which is our magnet, uh, which is pretty standard as a data collection um, device to go out and do your monthly readings. So let's talk a little bit about a, a specific asset and how we could attack monitoring that uh, to ensure that we're not gonna miss any problems that pop up. For the sake of our discussion, let's just take a, a motor and a pump. Now, if we wanna put that on a monthly route, we can take our Ultra Probe 15,000 with a, a contact probe or a stethoscope module, and we could go touch that particular asset. Typically, we'd look outboard, inboard, inboard, outboard. We could take a decibel reading. It's gonna record all the historical data when we hit the store button. In other words, we're gonna be able to take the time, the date, uh, we can enter in the RPMs, and we can, we can take a DB level that we can later use to trend. Uh, we can also take a sound recording, which we're able to put aside uh, for further analysis. Or in the case of something that doesn't look quite right, when we're taking our monthly reading, we could pull that uh, spectrum up right on the screen and take a look at it. So that's certainly one option for taking a look at that, that motor pump combination. The second option is if we've got some guarding, some shielding, some things that, that make it unsafe or inconvenient for us to go take those readings, we can certainly mount four of our RAS sensors um, on that on that motor and pump combination. That way we go out, we take those four RAS sensors, we bring those cables up to 100 feet away from the asset, and we're able to either put those one at a time into the end of, a, of an ultra probe and take a reading and a wave file, or we could run eight of those points, so we could do two motor pump combinations, and we could put it into one of our switch boxes. Okay, so there's two ways to go out and, and do historical trending on that motor. Then we simply take the information with an SD card, and we take the entire route that we've collected, and we put it right into our computer and right into our DMS software for a historical record. We can do the same thing with one of our 401 grease caddies that let us go out and monitor that asset. It won't let us record the sound, but it will let us take the DB levels as part of a lubrication program. Again, it would use the, the SD card to transfer that information over to our computer. Once we have the data and the sound files, we can look at our trends, we can keep our historical data in this part of DMS software. We can look at our trends via a chart and a graph. And then we can look at the sound files. We can do a little further analysis. We can either run our FFT analysis to determine what kind of a fault we've detected, whether it's an inner race, an outer race defect. Uh, we can also run a time waveform. In the case sometimes of slow speed bearings, it sometimes is effective to use a time waveform because we can actually see very small anomalies that pop up. So from a mechanical inspection standpoint, there's really two things we do. One is historical trending, 
we trend the DB levels over time, and we've set up alarm levels that help us make better decisions once we've hit one of those alarm levels. So a good bearing is going to start out with a lower DB level than a bad bearing, and then we're going to watch what happens over time. It's very effective on slow speed bearings. So if we have low RPM, 15, 20, 50 RPM, we can still go out and take decibel levels, take time waveforms, or take spectrums on that. If we're going to use the 401 grease caddy, we can use that as part of our condition-based lubrication so we get away from our time-based lubrication. The other thing about ultrasound is it, it does well in support of some of these other technologies. We've always been big believers that we can go out and take ultrasound readings and use it as a first line of defense, identify which of our, our points is showing high dB levels. And then if we're looking at a spectrum and we're not seeing what we want to see in an FFT of the ultrasound spectrum, we can look at a vibration spectrum as well. And that can, in some cases, tell us if we have problems like a misalignment, which is more difficult to detect using just ultrasound. Many of you are probably familiar with the, the PF curve or the I to P and F curve. Really, the, the I to P to F curve is from installation to the point at which a failure can first be detected to the point of where you have full functional failure. Obviously, the longer down or the further down that, that curve, the more damage can be caused and the more expensive it is once that, that fault is located. Um, ultrasound, vibration, many of these predictive technologies are all up on the highest end of the curve, but it's, it's almost not enough one of the things you want to be thinking about is what you can do to push that point P as far away as possible. In other words, from when that asset's installed to when an actual failure manifests itself. And one of the things that ultrasound can do to really help you in that what we call proactive domain is as part of a lubrication excellence program. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about lubrication and the fact that probably 60% of bearing failures are due to some lubrication related issues. Um, and being able to find that out ahead of time can help us push that, that point of failure, that P point a little further away. So we always say prepare to be successful. Um, prioritize the equipment you're going to go out and do condition monitoring on based on an asset catalog. You've got to know what you have uh, and based on an asset criticality assessment. Some of this equipment that you have is going to need more frequent testing. Uh, some of it you can put on a monthly route. Some you could put on a quarterly route. And there's probably some of your more critical assets that are appropriate for continuous 24-7 monitoring. Um, set up schedules based on this criticality index. Again, you know, the likelihood of it breaking down, what if it fails, you know, safety related issues, cost of repair, all those factors should come into play um, when you're preparing to go and do the condition monitoring. One thing that's nice, if you've already got vibration routes in place, um, you can really model those ultrasound routes right after the vibration routes. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So where we live in the ultrasound world, we've got action levels based on alarms. Um, our first alarm level, or what we call our low alarm level, is eight decibels over a baseline. Now it's important to remember, these are delta values. So the eight dB is eight dB above an initial baseline reading. And that's a strong indicator that that asset needs to be lubricated. We get up to a 16 dB increase over a baseline. And again, nothing's written in stone, but that does give us a very strong indication that there's damage there, that we've actually got a bearing fault. Um, typically, you could take that bearing out of the, the race, look at it, and you'd be able to see visual, visual faults on that bearing. Uh, once we get up into the 35 dB, that's what we call the critical area. Uh, severe failure is, is always possible. Um, so that's really from where we live in the ultrasound world. We base all of our condition monitoring on those alarm points.
One of the most important things you want to think about when you get your program started or if you're just continuing an existing program is the kind of reporting and documentation that you're going to need to be able to find the problems and, and document them. Um, the software that, that we use with both our handheld and our continuous monitoring systems, DMS and Spectralizer, that allows us to set up our baselines and keep a history of those and set up our alarm levels right inside of the software. We can create charts, uh, we can trend the DBs, we can also enter in other trendable items like temperature, like RPM. We can create custom reports, alarm reports. There's all kinds of things we can do inside of DMS and Spectralizer to help you make better decisions. Just a screenshot of uh, what the hierarchy looks like when we're setting up our database. We've got the ability to keep track of date and time items are tested, the DB level, what frequency it was tested at, uh, what our alarm level is, what type of module we use, and so forth. We go here and we can see by setting up our hierarchy, we can have a plant, an application. Uh, we can have several different groups. Each group will consist of 400 points. So take this group, for example, machine room. I can have, for example, 25 pump motor combinations, uh, or excuse me, 100 pump motor combinations, and set each up with four points. On each one of those points, I can have an unlimited history. And that history, by looking at this hierarchy, I can see that I've got a baseline reading, I've got a point that's entered a low alarm, and a point that's entered a high alarm. We're able to generate some multimedia reports. Um, so if this is a, something you need to email to somebody or something just for historical purposes you need to keep, um, electronically we can put together a report with all the pertinent information, screenshots of what the spectrums or time waveform look like. We could import uh, an infrared photo if we needed to. We could get a digital photograph, which we can take right off of the 15,000. We can even embed a sound file right into this digital report. So if we email someone, they don't even need DMS software. Uh, they can simply open that sound file and listen to it using Windows Media Player or any of the other programs that'll let you listen to sounds. With UE Spectralizer, again, we can analyze any of the recorded sound files we have. Uh, have to have an instrument that records sounds, so it's it's limited to use with the 10 or the 15,000 instruments. We can go in a little deeper into that Spectralizer software and actually identify whether we've got fault frequencies and what those fault frequencies mean. Is it an inner race defect, a cage, ball pass? What what exactly is going on based on where the where those where those frequencies are showing up? Um, we can also compare overlays. We can also take multiple different sound files and overlay them on each other so we can get a visual representation of what we heard. So let's talk for a minute uh, about ultrasound assisted lubrication, which has really become a huge topic uh, over the past several years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a huge number of failures are uh, attributed to lubrication related issues. They're over lubricated, under lubricated, you know, the wrong lubricant, uh, contamination in your lubrication. Um, traditionally, pretty much everybody did time-based lubrication. You would take um, the manufacturer's recommendations on how often that particular bearing needed to be lubricated, and you'd send someone out to put lubricant in. Okay. Um, very difficult to get it right. Very difficult to know exactly how much grease to apply uh, or how little. Um, using ultrasound, we're able to now both listen and look at the DB level, and we can actually determine exactly the right amount of grease to put into a bearing to bring it back to its baseline condition. Okay, very important also to be able to track the actual amount of lubricant used 
versus the planned lubricant amount. So inside of our DMS software, we've got a we've got a reporting function for lubrication specific applications that let us go and track what the PM said from the manufacturer, uh, how much lubricant to put in versus what you actually needed to bring that asset back to a baseline condition. So it's great for being able to document savings on actual lubricant use. So how do we help someone out doing the lubrication process? Well, number one, it's going to help them know when they when they need to stop, when they've put enough in, by looking at either the LEDs on a Grease Caddy 201 or watching the DB levels uh, on our 401 Grease Caddy and listening through the headphones. We're able to determine when that bearing has started to get quieter and when it goes back to its baseline level to where we need to know this is this is the time to stop putting grease in. Uh, we can also tell with that same process when we're starting to over lubricate the bearing. And typically, if we're out there in a lubrication process, it gives us the ability for another touch at that asset. In other words, the the ability to go out and just take a listen and see if there's any type of anomalies or anything that sounds strange when we're out doing the lubrication process. So if a bearing needs grease, the DB is going to decrease as the lubricant is applied. Um, it's a quick way to tell, hey, on a new a new asset that's been added to a route and you don't really have a lot of historical information on it, where is it at in its life cycle right now? So by putting a little bit of grease in, if it starts, if the DB levels start to go down, it needed it. We can also tell if a bearing already has enough because the DBs are going to start to increase while we're while we're greasing that asset. If there's no change, um, we really need to see why there wasn't a change. Is the bearing already in a failure mode? Lubrication's not the solution. Uh, typically, we can tell that by taking a sound recording and looking at the FFT spectrum. Do we see fault frequencies or do we not? Just a couple of screenshots. Um, this is a time waveform, a picture of a time waveform. Unfortunately, we can't listen to this through the webinar. Um, but as you can see on the left is amplitude, on the bottom is time. Um, there's a bearing that needed to be lubricated. As the lubricant was put in, you can see once that lubricant reached the uh, this surface area, uh, the wear surface, the sound level dropped dramatically uh, and leveled off. In this illustration, uh, we have taken a bearing that needed lubrication, we lubricated it, and then continued until we began to over lubricate. And as you can see by this by this illustration, uh, it very quickly the sound level will start to creep back up and then go right back to to uh, where it was. If that if that bearing is over lubricated in a very short period of time, 48 seconds in this case. Here's an example of a lube report. You can see some of the different things we have here. We've got our baseline level in green. We can see the DBs over time uh, in the blue line where it hit a baseline or it hit a low alarm level. We lubricated it and it dropped back down. Uh, and then obviously in this case, lubrication wasn't enough. Perhaps it was a bad bearing and the DB level shot right back up the following month. Um, we can also look at the actual strokes needed to bring it back to baseline versus what the planned strokes were or what the recommendation was for that particular asset. So by looking at the actual strokes, we can see here they're quite a bit less to bring that back to baseline than what was recommended. So if we'd have done the recommended amount of strokes, we probably would have over lubricated that bearing. Uh, at the very least, we're talking a significant cost savings in the amount of lubricant used by following uh, a, a condition-based strategy rather than a time-based strategy. Maureen, is there any questions as we move on to the continuous monitoring part? Any questions that I should jump in on here about the handheld? So far, you're good. So, okay. journey on. Uh, journey on. Um, so, let's talk a little bit now about continuous monitoring. We've talked about uh, doing handheld 
you know, route-based data collection and some of the steps you need to take and some of the reporting that's available. Let's talk about not doing that. Let's talk about going out and permanently installing some sensors and having that asset monitored 24-7. So we've got several different condition monitoring products. Uh, I'll go through and describe all of these, and then I'm going to focus in on just a couple of them. Uh, the first is an analog sensor. It's called an Ultratrack 750. Uh, this is a really simple sensor. Essentially, we supply it with power, and then we monitor what that sensor draws against a 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. So we can actually look at uh, as it draws more milliamps, we can correlate that roughly to a dB level, and we can determine if something has changed on a on a motor, on a valve, on a pump, uh, any real you know contact application is where we could use this analog sensor. Now this is going to need something to read it. In other words, you need to plug this into your PLC to to keep track of what it's drawing against that 4 to 20 milliamp loop. So we're only supplying the front end here. Uh, stainless steel, real small sensor, just a couple inches long, about half an inch around. We've also got another simple analog sensor. Uh, it's an Ultratrack uh, five, uh, 586 sensor. Now what this 586 does is relatively the same thing as the 750. You get a, a current loop that you draw against or you can get a voltage out. The main difference is that the electronics are contained in the 750 here with the 586. The electronics are in this box that can be mounted up to 100 feet away from this RAS sensor. So for harsher environments where you don't want the electronics in a high ambient temperature environment, for example, you could use the 586. Again, both simple analog sensors. Now we'll move into our RAS sensors. Uh, this may be familiar for you Ultra Probe users out there. This is our transducer that comes with every 10 and 15,000 uh, that you use to go out and take readings. But we've also got that, that remote access sensor in a different configuration. We've got it in a, a permanent mount configuration where we can take that mount it on a motor or a fan or a pump and we can run a cable up to 100 feet away with a, a BNC connection on this sensor and then we can either go up handheld with our ultra probes and take a reading or we can run it in to our new forecast system. Now the forecast system is a 24-7 monitoring system that can take up to four of the RAS sensors uh, and it basically does a couple of different things. One, it sits there out near your asset monitoring those four points all the time. Think of it as a person standing there with an ultra probe listening to it every second of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. It's there all the time. Now we can program that forecast to take a reading for us. We can tell it, go take a reading once a day, once a month, however often we want to take a reading based on the criticality of that asset. And then it'll store it right on board. We can set up alarms inside of the software. So when this forecast hits an alarm, any time on that asset's life, it's going to store a reading immediately and it's going to notify you, whether that be by text or by email, that point number three, for example, is in alarm. So it not only grabs a DB, but it can grab a sound file as well. The next thing that that forecast does is since it is monitoring 24 7, when something does go into alarm, after it notifies you, you can set up more frequent data collection before it went into alarm, during alarm, and after. So it actually stores however many readings you tell it to. So once it hits the alarm, you can go back in time and you can take a look at what led up to that alarm. Okay. The last thing the forecast does is it allows us at any time to go look at the condition of that asset real time. And we can take DB levels, we can record sounds, we can listen to it, whatever we want to do real time from a remote location. 
This is an Ethernet enabled typically. Uh, no reason you couldn't do it wireless, but we're finding most people are using this as an Ethernet enabled system. In the last um, permanent continuous monitoring sensor we have is called an ECM, electric cabinet monitor. This is the only airborne sensor of the group. What this really does is, is mounts inside of a piece of switch gear and it'll notify you with a voltage out or with an audio out that you have an arcing or a tracking condition inside of that switch gear without having to go up and, and monitor the switch gear either through a, an ultrasound port or by listening around the cracks in the door. Uh, it, it, this sits inside of the switch gear mounted and listens all the time. So I talked briefly about the RAS sensors and what we're able to do with those. Uh, we can go monitor those one at a time, or if, if the asset's mounted in an area where it's not safe or not convenient for a tech to go out and take readings, we can bring the sensors, up to eight of them, back into a switch box, which we can mount in a convenient, safe, easy to get to location. Uh, quite simply, you take the Ultra Pro, plug it into the, the switch box, and you're able to click through eight different sensors that could be as much as 100 feet away. You're able to do DB levels, you're able to record sounds. So all the functionality of doing it with the handheld unit, we can do by just plugging it in once big time saver um, for running routes. Also, uh, for us, from a safety aspect, uh, very nice addition to the, to the repertoire. So let's talk a little bit now about the forecast system, the 24-7 condition monitoring system. Again, I'm going to use a, a motor and a pump combination as the asset. And we can mount four RAS sensors onto that. We take those RAS sensors and we run those into that forecast system. Again, we're going to program the forecast to tell it how often do we want to take a reading, how often do we want to take a wave file. Those readings and wave files are going to be stored on the forecast itself. Then we also program it when to send a reading and a wave file over to the software in our computer, provided no alarm condition occurred. If an alarm condition occurs, the forecast instantly grabs a sound file and a DB level. It starts storing at a new acquisition rate that we've pre-programmed it to do, and it sends an email or a text alerting whoever needs to be alerted that, for example, point number one is an alarm. We take the information once it's in the computer, and we're able to use all the functionality of our DMS software. In other words, we can keep historical records. We can trend that particular point over time. We can take those sound files and we can perform spectrum analysis, FFT on them, determine based on what harmonics we're seeing, what kind of a defect we have, and we can look at our time waveforms as well. So really the, the forecast system is the person sitting out there monitoring every second of every day of every year, only you don't need that person to do that. Uh, the forecast is going to do all of that for you. The software, DMS has your back. Um, if you're responsible for multiple assets, remote locations, multiple sites, that system is going to continuously watch for alarms, send a text or email, as I said, when a point enters an alarm, we're able to customize how often, under what kind of conditions, or where or who that notification gets sent to. So for example, here's what the email looks like. DMS sent an email. In this case, uh, we've got an alarm level of 24 decibels. Um, this was on motor two, motor outboard. We're able to see a, or listen to a sound file via email that the system is automatically going to generate. We can also see a trend chart. So some real valuable information at, at the very second something enters an alarm. If we want to do it via text, the only thing we're missing is we're unable to get the sound file from a text, but we are able to determine, you know, motor two, motor outboard, what the baseline was and what high alarm level was reached.
So let's look just a little closer at the forecast system. Uh, it uses the RAS sensor, so it makes it a real scalable system. In other words, if you've already got RAS sensors mounted in your facility and you're doing handheld you know, monthly data collection, very easily uh, can be switched over to a forecast on any particular asset group. You just take four of the RASs and they have a BNC connection, plug them right into the forecast, hook it up to the ethernet, and you're pretty much off and running once you program the software. Uh, the way it works, to oversimplify here, but it, it's fairly easy. You basically are gonna download um, a server uh, and DMS6 software to a computer, whichever computer hosts the server is where you're gonna need to get a, a static IP address for that computer. You take the IP address from that computer, you enter it directly into the forecast box. This opens up. There's a spin and click dial in here to enter this static IP address in. Once you enter it in, this box becomes discoverable. Very similar to what you do with your, your phone and your car when you're linking it up Bluetooth. So once they're communicating, once the box is discoverable, the server in the computer assigns the box its own unique IP address. And then anytime you have access to this computer, you can go see any forecast associated with it by just pulling it up on the screen through DMS and finding out what the condition of those assets are. You could also do this wirelessly. No reason you couldn't just by using some wireless routers. Uh, it's set up really for ethernet, um, but we're finding that, that there are a few instances where people remotely want to take a look at what's going on with a particular asset. So even at a, a remote site, different state, different country, as long as you have access past the firewall to the computer where that server is hosted, you're able to go see all the different forecast boxes associated um, with that particular server. No different than a wired system, really. So we set it up based on a normal data collection route, our normal hierarchy, just like we do with a handheld, we can take an existing database that we've been running routes with a handheld unit, and we can simply just switch it over to a forecast route. Here's a, a screenshot of what it looks like. In this case, sensor four exceeded an alarm level. So the next step would be it would store a sound file, it would store a DB level, and it would send either a text or an email. Uh, if it sends an email, it'll send it with a sound file for you to do some further analysis and take appropriate action. We can take that historical data and we can chart that. Anything that has the icon next to it obviously has a sound file attached. We just go click on open and oop, we bring up our Spectralizer software with our harmonics that we can see here, our harmonic cursor lets us go in and determine what type of a, of a failure is evident based on this FFT. In this case, it's, a, it's showing up like an outer race defect. Again, we can generate some nice multimedia reports. We can bring in those trend charts. We can bring in screenshots of the spectrums or the FFTs or the time waveforms, and we can attach wave files to any of the reports. So some of the highlights on the forecast system, the heavy data storage is right on board the forecast. So we're not streaming live data and tying up a lot of ethernet bandwidth. It's stored on board until an alarm happens and then it sends it over or until we've programmed it to send it over. So you literally could be taking a reading every minute and then only if nothing happens, no alarms are reached, it could just send over uh, that data and a sound file once a month. So it uses an existing ethernet network, which makes it pretty easy to expand. We're able to expand those, uh, those boxes just by installing uh, new forecast boxes and using an existing RAS sensor to plug into. So sort of ultrasound in general, the flexibility is there. You know, most of the people out there with, with 
effective and successful ultrasound programs uh, always make the statement it's one of the first technologies they want to start with. It's flexible. Um, we can do handheld data collection. We've got plenty of continuous monitoring options. You know, really the best way to look at it is with a hybrid program. Um, I don't know if we've reached a point where you want to take uh, our continuous monitoring and continuously monitor every single bearing or every single motor in a plant, uh, but certainly ones that are critical, certainly ones that are, you know, create safety problems to go take those monthly readings are good candidates for doing continuous monitoring. Uh, the others you can still do the handheld data collection. Ultrasound, easy to deploy, really quick to get somebody spun up on how to use it. So a very short learning curve. Um, overall decibel level with ultrasound is a great leading indicator that something's changed. And, you know, we're, we're typically finding it'll give us a very early warning when the friction level increases. So we know, hey, we've either got a lubrication issue or this bearing's entered a failure mode. In addition to the continuous monitoring and the, and the condition monitoring of rotating assets, Ultrasound is flexible enough to work on a lot of other applications. You know, it's great for energy programs, compressed air, compressed gases, great for steam traps, great for electrical. So there's a, a whole slew of different things we can use the same tool for uh, that, that certainly helps with cost justifications and so forth. Um, we can look at that spectrum analysis, the FFT and the time waveforms whenever needed. So it's nice to be able to record those both um, on the instrument and have a, a permanent record over in our software. But if we need to look at an FFT while we're out in the field, we can pull it right up on the 15,000 on the screen and take a look. So that's what I've got, Maureen. Um, Obviously, if we don't get all your questions answered live, you know, anybody is, is welcome to drop me an email and we'll get your questions answered. And I will turn this back over to you, Maureen. All right. So, yeah, we did have some questions come through and um, I've, um, I'm going to kind of start throwing these out to you. Um, first one, someone was wondering if you could just go over the, um, the ECM again and just kind of quick explain what that um, option was all about sure the electric cabinet monitor is an an airborne sensor uh, similar to what you'd have when you were using a handheld ultra probe for leak detection so it's a, an airborne module that sensor mounts inside of your electrical switchgear cabinet so it physically mounts inside now you do need to run a cable out so it's not a wireless system. So once that cable is run out, then we're able to set an adjustable sensitivity so we can sort of set it up at a, a baseline noise level inside of the inside of the switch gear. And then based on what the current draw is, so in other words, if that sensor then detects a sound, it's gonna draw on a four to 20 milliamp current loop. So the more it's drawing, the louder the sound is. Or we can do a zero to 10 volt out, so essentially the same thing. The louder the sound, the more voltage out we're gonna get from it. Um, the last thing we can do with that ECM is it does have an audible out. So we could run it directly into some type of a, of a speaker. We could probably run it directly into, a, into that spectrum analysis software. So you could actually see if you had a, see if you had the, the telltale signature of tracking or arcing. All right, cool. Um, okay, then someone's asking, question. so yeah, I think that's good. Um, certainly, obviously, email us if it didn't. Um, another one, so we've got a customer who is using their 15,000 for the first time on assets like fans, um, and they're wondering how they know if what if the, the bearing is already in the failure mode? Um, what's kind of a way to standardize uh, when you don't quite know what the current condition of a bearing is or if it's, you know, in a normal condition or what? Two ways to so do that. The first thing is, that I would tell you is listen to it. I mean, a good bearing is going to sound smooth. It's going to have a rushing sound. A uh, bad bearing that's obviously bad is going to have popping and crackling and just not sound good. Um, if you want to be a little more scientific than just relying on your ears, certainly recording a wave file 
on that initial baseline reading and looking at the FFT. If you're just seeing amplitude across that FFT spectrum, in other words, all the peaks are sort of the same height, um, it's probably in a good condition. If you start to see harmonics that will tend to be related to each other, um, you know, you see spikes essentially, peaks, you could have yourself a bearing that's already entered a failure mode, you know, the first time you tested it. That's usually what people will do when they take their baseline readings. They'll take a sound file uh, and a dB level and, you know, take a look at that FFT spectrum and see what it looks like. Flat is usually good, you know, peaks usually means there's some type of a defect. Okay. Sorry, they're just, they're kind of flying in, so I'm losing track here of, of the, the ones that I was about to ask you. But but as Doug said, if we don't get to your question, we will 100% be following up um, individually with, with folks after, uh, after we hop off on here. Um, sorry, I had, they, they're, they keep flying out of my radar here. Um, so do we have a database of applications um, that we can that folks can use to like give folks a, a baseline not really everything's going to be different that's the problem i mean it, it you know depending on running speed conditions type of lubricant use type of bearing you know type of motor there's not it there's not really a fixed database i mean what we do have is we have a pretty extensive library of sounds, examples that we can get people. Um, we, we know that that 8 dB, 16 dB as a low alarm, high alarm is a, is a good industry standard that has a proven success record out there. Um, you know, obviously there's going to be some slight changes to that. Like if you had VFDs, for example, you'd probably open up those, uh, you'd spread those alarms a little higher, uh, to compensate, so you might make it instead of eight and sixteen, you might make it, you know, twelve and twenty. Um, we've got uh, we've got tons of sound files people can listen to, but yeah, there's not really a fixed library. And just since you mentioned VFDs, we have there's a few of you guys asking kind of specific questions about that. I'll send those of you that are. Um, a really great presentation that we've got on our website about um, those. So that might be a helpful resource for those of you that have some specific questions around that. Um, okay, so talking about electrical um, monitoring, so someone was wondering, are there examples of ultrasonics being used for electrical monitoring within electrical equipment other than just panels? Uh, sure, not... Um... I guess I'm with the question to, yeah, we use ultrasound handheld units all the time to test transformers. We use it to test, you know, insulators out in switch gear or in, uh, in substations. We use it for, you know, all kinds of electrical applications there. Uh, the ECM is really just decide, designed to be mounted inside a switch gear, but the handhelds are used for all kinds of electrical applications. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's kind of what they meant. What else you could use ultrasound on for for that? Um, okay, and then talk a little bit about kind of not ultrasound versus vibration in terms of you know using it on bear on bearing condition monitoring, but kind of how they maybe would work to complement one another. Since so we've got a few questions about you know how well, does one this of the work things that. that and, one of the things that we hear all the time is that you take a, a facility that's got, you know, a thousand bearings that they need to go test. Well, the fact is, if you were to go out every single month and take a thousand readings with vibration, um, it, it, the acquisition takes longer because you're actually building a spectrum each time you go out and take a reading. So, you know, the data acquisition is three points for every bearing or, or three, you know, listening in three places on every, you know, radial, axial, and horizontal. Um, so the time itself to take those readings to then come back to find out that nothing's changed in, in a month, whereas ultrasound from a, a pure data acquisition standpoint, pure speed of, of taking the reading, you know, takes 
probably less than a third of the time to take a reading. She can get through the route faster. And if nothing's changed, the dBs are going to stay the same. If the dBs go up, you're able to use ultrasound as an actual sorting tool. So out of that 1,000 bearings, if 800 of them are exactly the same and you find 200 of them, which would be a lot, but if you found 200 of them that had elevated dB levels, you could take a quick look at the sound file with ultrasound, say, okay, uh, there's no harmonics there. It's simply just an amplitude increase. Let's go lube those and see if that drops back down. On the few, let's say out of the 200 remaining, maybe 20 of them have you know, visible harmonics in the ultrasound spectrum. If it wasn't obvious to you, you could then go out and do vibe on just those 20, and you could figure out if it was a problem that the ultrasound couldn't readily identify, like a misalignment condition. So it's almost a, a weeding out process and a time-based process. You also don't need the same skill sets uh, and the same level of um, you know, analysis to look at an ultrasound spectrum and say, do I see harmonics or not? versus being able to, to analyze and understand what you're looking at on a vibration spectrum. So the biggest, I think, really, just in my opinion, is the time. You know, going out there and spending the time, um, to, it's overkill to go spend all that time to take all those vibe readings when you could sort out which ones really need it using ultrasound. And then the, the second side of that, I'll say, is on your slower speed, bearings. If you get down below 300 RPM, you know, now you're looking at data acquisition time of almost double to triple of what it would be on your normal, you know, 1800 RPM motor. So now we're talking about an even wider gap between how much, you know, work can you get done out there and how much condition monitoring can you do with ultrasound versus how much you could do with Vibe and do you really need to? All right, awesome. So I'm going to take the screen back here. Um, there definitely are still some more questions, but like I said, we'll we'll get to you guys um, offline. Um, and in a lot of wide range, we had questions about the electrical, we had some steam, we had some questions about leaks and lubrication. So definitely a, a, a very diverse uh, group of attendees today. So that was great, and and Excellent. we've got information on on all those applications. So we will 100% follow up and and get everybody all the info they need. And it's, it's good to know that webinars like this, you know, where we can talk, you know, about ultrasound are, are valued and, and we'll, we'll try and do some more application specific ones um, throughout the year so we can touch, you know, specifically on the, the applications that you guys are interested in. Um, so Doug, thanks for, for doing that presentation. Um, just to kind of get on your calendar, the next webinar we're gonna do um, is going to again be about ultrasound, but our, our friend Tim Dunton from Reliability Solutions is going to be the one presenting it. He's going to be talking about uh, improving the re reliability of fluid power systems with ultrasound. If you haven't ever heard him present, he's amazing and it'll be a really great um, presentation. So we'll have an invite out for that soon, so keep an eye out. And then, of course, it's never too early to mark your calendars for our conferences. Um, ultrasound world and reliable asset world um, so we'll be back down in Clearwater Beach Florida next May um, lots of great information um, and, and lots of great ultrasound users like like some of those of you that were on today um, sharing sharing really good info so uh, mark your calendars for that and then with that we'll we'll let you all go we'll be in touch with with everybody that had questions whether it got answered or not just to be sure we've we've taken care of you and um, don't hesitate to ever reach out to us and we'll let you guys go and have a great rest of the day and uh, look forward to hearing from, from you guys soon.